Shanks is a confirmed celestial dragon. Imu is immortal. Mother flaming what? The One Piece manga is set to undergo a five week break, but not before Oda dropped a huge chapter that leaves us plenty to talk about, with the recent chapter revealing that Shanks might be of noble blood after all. On top of this, we finally learned all the names of the Gorosei, and even discovered that Vegapunk is behind the catastrophic end of the Lulucia kingdom. So let's start straight away, shall we? Starting with Lulucia, because we finally found out what is behind its destruction. But before we get into detail on that, I want to talk about this scene with Imu and the Gorosei at length. It's a scene that provided much greater context on the contents of chapter 1060. If you remember, the navy was tracing Sabo's call and deduced that he was hiding at Lulucia. And the Gorosei had an interesting response to this fact, which we now know to be a surprise at the coincidence of these events because Imu had already decided by this point to destroy the island and Sabo just happened to be there, which makes sense as to why they refer to Sabo as an unlucky man and stated that it was simply his destiny. Now we know that this was in reference to his destiny to be a casualty of Lulucia's destruction, which turned out to be a killing two birds with one stone scenario in their favor. Or so they thought anyways if it wasn't for Sabo's Den Den VPN. After saying in my last video how crazy it would be if Odo released all the Gorosei's name in one sitting, he's gone and done just that. And the reveals sure don't disappoint. Not only their names, but their individual roles which also says a lot. So I want to examine the individual responses of the Gorosei to Imu's request because I really like how Oda manages to mix each of the Gorosei justifying their actions in tandem with how a leader in each of their positions would react. I really think it highlights his genius when it comes to writing dialogue, even in a limited setting. Saturn simply obliges to take action, which makes sense since he's in charge of defense science, which correlates well with the handle of weaponry and also makes perfect sense why he's the one out of all the Gorosei to go to Egghead Island and deal with Vegapunk because here you have a proven warrior that can battle but also has the brains to handle the technologically dense situation involving Vegapunk and Egghead. Which has me very excited for this interaction that we are sure to see very very soon. Mars, the environmental warrior god, strikes me as the epitome of someone that would blindly follow everything Imu asks for because he believes that god Imu is above all else. Valkyrie, or Mercury as the justice warrior god sees this opportunity as a necessary example to make about defying the world order. Venus Juro, who by the way, this Juro part in his name on top of his outfit all but confirms his relationship to the land of Wano. And he seems to be thinking of the future benefits of being able to freely use such a weapon. And now knowing his title makes you think that most of his logic is financially calculated. After all, one giant explosion does seem like it's more cost effective effective than having to deploy a whole fleet of ships and marines. Finally, Jew Peter, who likes the idea of instantly snuffing out any protracted conflict, is a forward-thinking man because predictive calculation is crucial in the field of agriculture. All of them seem to have sound experience in their fields when assessing the situation, which I have to say is a very direct contrast to Imu. While the Gorosei are calculative, Imu has a childlike impulsivity in them. This chapter showcases really just how un reasonable Imu is. When asked what's the reason why Lulucia was selected to be the test for Mother Flame, Imu simply responds that it's its close proximity. It's a sign of a childlike attitude showing either the impatience in wanting to see what they want to happen in the quickest way possible, or the curiosity to witness chaos themselves up close. Either way, the Gorosei offered no resistance to this request. It also makes sense in terms of Imu's immortal nature, portraying them to be of very little humanity. Which which is somewhat understandable given how many civilizations they will have witnessed come and go. There's just so much to love about how Oda is handling the characterization of Imu and the Gorosei. And I'm actually starting to buy more and more into the idea that Imu is indeed a little kid that controls the world from the shadows and combine this with the idea that Imu is also immortal, it makes me think of two devil fruits that might have been used in tandem to achieve Imu's current state. It was also confirmed as I speculated in my last chapter 
discussion that the name Imu is indeed a first name and it belonged to someone back during the void century called Saint Imu from House Nerona. If Imu is immortal, then of course the Ope Ope no Mi is the obvious choice to grant eternal youth. But I also think it's possible that Bonnie's Devil Fruit might have also played a part in this situation. And well, the first reason for this is the simple fact that Bonnie is heavily involved in this same arc that Imu is as well. So a connection between the two might somehow be made. And this is a way to do so. But another reason is because I'm speculating that Imu was turned immortal as an adult, but then was turned younger by the previous user of Bonnie's Devil Fruit. It could have even happened unintentionally, where Imu wanted to be younger forever, but the fruit turned them way too young, and this is the reason why they're always cloaked all over, to hide themselves from embarrassment. And that latter part is just something that I thought would be funny, but the idea just fits the more I think about it. In terms of the island destroying weapon, intriguingly called Mother Flame, I tried searching for the inspiration for this based on its name, and the only thing I found is something out of a book by the author Tamora Pierce. Like One Piece, Tamora Pierce created a world called the Tortalan Universe, and within this story is a weapon called the Mother Flame, which consists of half the world's ancient beings known as the First Powers. What's interesting is that in this fictional mythology of the book, this is also called Mother Fire or Mother Rain, which I just happened to find quite an interesting alternative name for the weapon. If you consider that what destroyed Lelucia is something that rained down fire. A disclosure to be made though is that this book series started in 2010, way after Ichiro Oda first created One Piece, so perhaps this is just a coincidence, or perhaps there's something else that both Oda and Pierce were inspired by, and that I was just unable to find. Or Oda maybe started thinking about this element only partway through his series after coming across Pierce's work. But something I know has existed for a while that Oda was definitely inspired by is the film Castle in the Sky. And now I made a video about this over a year ago, so if you haven't watched it yet, please do so because it tells you how Oda may have created the world and the mystique of One Piece. Anyways, the reason why I mentioned this is because in that movie, there exists an ancient weapon that was awakened and what's even more interesting is when I show you what this weapon looks like. See that? Pay close attention to what it looks like. See how this weapon is attached to a floating island above it? Okay, so then now allow me to connect this to something that you're already familiar with. Back in chapter 1060, and now confirmed in this chapter, that enormous shadow that was hovering in the sky and caused the attack that wiped out Lulucia is this thing called Mother Flame, which is now revealed to be a weapon that Vegapunk most likely invented, and I'm starting to think it's an invention created to replicate or rival one of the ancient weapons. Something that Vegapunk replicated for Imu to satisfy the childlike god's fascination, even obsession with controlling the power of an ancient weapon, or another creation for Imu and the Gorosei to rival an ancient weapon in the case that they will one day have to go against one and need something of equal power. Very in line with the real world security and power dynamics in the scramble for nuclear weapons. Right down to how it also serves as a threat to preserve peace ironically, prevent coercion and deter aggression for those they wish to rule. And it's not hard to imagine someone who may have been alive since these ancient times to have knowledge about the ancient weapons. Pluton is of course the ancient weapon in question, because as far as we know, it is the only ancient weapon capable of being reproduced because there was a blueprint for it. And we know that Vegapunk's inventions were all inspired by its more advanced version from ancient times. So it's possible that Mother Flame is the prototype of what came out of trying to replicate this ancient weapon. After all, if someone can create a super tech, it's Vegapunk. So if Mother Flame is a copy of Pluton, which we now know is at Wano, then it's possible that Oda's plan for the opening of Wano's borders relates to the inspiration from Castle in the Sky. So it could be the case that bringing down the walls around Wano will unlock the island and allow parts of it to fly above the clouds. Parts that are attached to Pluton, and hopefully parts without citizens, and this island slash weapon would use the same or perhaps even a stronger attack than what the Mother Flame has been shown to do. But also, if Vegapunk indeed invented what destroyed Lulucia by replicating an ancient weapon, it makes you wonder whether the original was created by the work of a single person smarter than Vegapunk. Because this might also answer Dragon's question as to why it took so long for the government to use it. And now we're getting into over speculation mode here, but I know some of you came for that. And you know I like covering all my bases when it comes to satisfying all different types of viewers. So, I really like the details in 
how Sabo clarified all the events that we were wondering about, even down to the details of how he was able to successfully fool the government into thinking he was still at Lulucio. To make sure that any cause about plot armor is annihilated like Lulucio was. I'd also like to point out how Dragon has complete trust in Vegapunk to not intentionally create a killing machine while he needed to hear from Sabo himself that he didn't really kill Cobra. I mean, I know you've known Vegapunk for longer, but come on man, that's your second in command. He's supposed to be your most trusted companion. I just think it's a little hilarious. It's just that someone as serious about opposing the world government, overturning the system like Dragon, doubted his own second in command, but not the man who chose to join the very thing that he's trying to bring down. I mean, I guess if anything, it just hammers in that we should also be trustful of Vegapunk and see the scientist in a good light. Which is important because he is looking very suspicious right now as the so-called creator of the island zapping machine. So it might also be the case that Vegapunk did design something powerful, but not with the intent of harming others. We know that Vegapunk's ultimate goal is to provide free energy for everybody around the world. And perhaps he was already working on this, but whatever he designed was used in the wrong way. Vegapunk might have created the source of this weapon via his designs, but the world government took over, and instead of using it to spread energy around the world, they instead adjusted it so that energy could be concentrated into a smaller area, ultimately transforming Vegapunk's design into an island-destroying machine. This might also be the same thing we saw in Chapter 594 that sucked up Beige's ship, which I think could have been a distraction from what was really happening. I think Vegapunk might have found a way to create renewable energy by using seawater, and what we saw in Chapter 594 was the weapon sucking up seawater from the ocean to convert it into energy and use that to power up the Mother Flame, but then Beige's ship just happened to be within the vicinity at the time. But what do you think about this idea? Let's move on to something that everyone wants to talk about. The appearance of the Supreme Commander of the God Knight, Saint Figurland Garling. Holy hell, this is if you've seen the One Piece movie, Film Red, then you understand the hype behind revealing this name. But in case you didn't watch the film, first of all, what? Why? What are you doing? Why didn't you watch it? And also, here are some spoilers. In that movie, the Gorosei learned of the existence of Shanks' daughter Uta, and not knowing the full circumstances, questioned whether Uta is also of the Figurland family, seeing as she is Shanks' daughter. Heavily implying, without outright confirming, that Shanks is from the Figurland bloodline. Now, whether you consider Film Red canon or not, the fact that the Figurland name from the movie now also exists within canon material makes it as real as anything else you know about the series. So again, holy hell, this is huge. Saint Garling is related to Shanks, and although we don't know exactly how, based on his age, the easy speculation to have is that he is Shanks' father, if not uncle, but certainly an older relative of some sort. But Oda gave us more than just revealing the name Figurland and what he looks like because we are also told that Garling Figurland was the former king of God Valley. And we know from a film read data book that Shanks was found in a treasure chest by Roger and his crew at God Valley. And the image of baby Shanks surrounded by gold in volume 4 billion. He certainly looked like he belonged in a well-off family with his cute little patterned baby pajamas. So long story short, we can deduce that Shanks is of nobility and more than likely the prince of God Valley, the infamous island where legends battled and disappeared. And considering that Saint Garling himself is a fighter, then this is another big name who was more than likely involved during those epic times. And now I'm starting to think of Whitebeard's words to Shanks back in chapter 434 might have a different meaning now. Back then, Whitebeard said that when he looks at Shanks' face, it makes his scars ache. The scars that he got from the elusive him. Now of course on the first read, you'd think that this is Roger seeing as Roger and Whitebeard had infamous clashes, but then when Rox was introduced and revealed as Whitebeard's old captain, and with Whitebeard being one of the good pirates in the series, that made you think that perhaps during the Battle of God Valley, maybe Whitebeard turned against his captain and was inflicted wounds by Rox instead. But now, with the introduction of Garling, we have a new candidate about who Whitebeard was referring to. And this is really looking right about the perfect time for the God Valley incident flashback to be shown to us. Because I'm really dying 
time to know what exactly is the relationship between the Celestial Dragons and God Valley. If the Figureland are Celestial Dragons, then there's a question there as to how Garling was still the former king of God Valley. For all intents and purposes, when the world nobles joined at Marajoie, they renounced their kingdoms, becoming the Celestial Dragons instead. So what does this say about the Figureland family? Is God Valley an exception? Or what does this instead suggest about the makeup of the Holy Knights? And because this news is so big and requires a lot more unpacking, I do think we should have a video just dedicated to the Figureland family. And if that's an idea that interests you, then please let me know in the comments below. But going back to Shanks' pajamas, check out those patterns. Sun, moon, and stars. Now the stars might be symbolizing his potential status as a celestial dragon, and well, the moon is his blood as Figureland, because just take a look at Garling's head shape. A crescent moon, just like what Shanks has on his jammies. But what about the sun? Oh boy, here comes another speculation for you. This sun might be signifying that Shanks himself is a part of the D clan. Yep, you heard it. We're speculating that Shanks is an offspring of both a D clan member and a celestial dragon. Two mortal and destined enemies. Shanks is the product of this union. And here's another crazy idea for you. Each side of Shanks' face represents one of his bloodlines. One side is clean and the other is scarred. The light and the dark side of his blood. Alright look, it's late and if you haven't been able to tell from my voice I'm actually sick so I might just be a little bit delirious but let me have some fun guys. Also why not throw in the comment section your own wacky ideas and when you're done doing that let's have a quick memorial for Mozgard and share some nice words in the comments for this legend who protected the daughter of the person who showed him kindness and saved his life. I mean seriously what a wonderful full circle that is. Queen Otohime saving Mozgard and defending him against the idea of the merfolk led to her daughter being saved. Even in death, Queen Otohime is protecting her children. And it's crazy how much power the gods knights hold to have a public execution in front of other celestial dragons cheering. What a way to hype up their status, passing judgment via a public execution of supposedly untouchable figures. And seeing Mjolsgaard in that state wasn't the only sad part about this chapter, because this scene also featured a really sad moment about Vivi wanting to call Cobra because she thinks he's definitely worried about her, not realizing that Cobra is dead. This made me think back to the times that Cobra used to secretly follow Vivi around when she was a kid to watch her play with the other kids because he was worried about her. And to know that she has no father to call anymore really makes me feel for Vivi. Someone who doesn't seem to worry about his own family though is Steli, who is seen falling in love with Vivi's picture with complete disregard for his brother Sabo. And the way the chapter opened up with the fallout of the reverie and the chaos surrounding Vivi and Wapo's disappearance meant that we learned a lot more about the details about how all the important characters involved in this arc managed to escape by each hiding themselves in various different ships of the kingdom leaving Marajoa. Sabo, who we already know, hid in the Lulucia kingdom ship. Bonnie, who stowed away aboard the Tajin kingdom ship, which I have to say is a very fitting connection given that Tajin is a name of a Moroccan dish and we know all about Bonnie's gluttony. And finally, Vivi and Wapol escaped by hiding inside the Aegis Kingdom ship. While the island Tajin itself hasn't made an appearance, we were briefly introduced, along with the other world leaders, to its monarch, Queen Morolan, back in chapter 905. Also, of course, we saw the rest of the Seraphims, and I'll make this quick. Here's something for all of you to talk about. Out of all the three Seraphims, S. Croco is the only one not shown with his full chest out on display. Croco mom theory, anyone? Okay, I kid. But maybe I don't. What do you think? A crazy chapter, chock block full of reveals as if Oda was biting back at all those claims about how each of his reveals are always just the tease. This one was the full shebang. It certainly gave us a lot to talk about, especially while we wait and hope for his speedy recovery. So make sure to subscribe so that you don't miss out on any of those future videos. Let me know what you thought by leaving a comment below. Thank you to all of our Patreon and channel members. And thanks to all of you for listening to another one of my ramblings. This is Joy Girl, and I'll see you again soon.